You are listening to Midway Pilots, Prisoners of the Japanese, written and narrated by Mark Felton. This is an audio-only episode for War Stories with Mark Felton. The Battle of Midway on the 5th of June 1942 would end with Japan's vaunted carrier fleet in ruins, and Japan placed on the defensive at sea. It was also one of the Second World War's great turning points. Only half a year before Midway, the US Pacific Fleet had been devastated by the stunning Japanese carrier strike against Pearl Harbor, masterminded by Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto. Although the Japanese had inflicted serious damage on the American battleship fleet, Yamamoto's pilots had failed to locate and destroy the American aircraft carriers, which even at that stage of the war were the key to naval supremacy in the Pacific. For the Japanese, it meant that they would eventually have to deal with those carriers in a major fleet engagement, and failure to destroy them a second time would mean that Japan would be thrown on the defensive in the Pacific theater. The Japanese decided to take the initiative and place the American carriers in a position from where they could be destroyed. Central to their plan was an attack on Midway Island, a lonely U.S. outpost in the Pacific. This attack would provide a lure that the American carrier fleet commanders could not resist reacting to. A Japanese victory would secure them naval supremacy until at least late 1943, and push Japan's defensive perimeter still further from the home islands. As it happened, American penetration of Japan's naval codes enabled Admiral Chester Nimitz to trap the Japanese fleet instead. Midway was the battle that decided who would ultimately win in the Pacific, and it was the first carrier versus carrier battle in history, where none of the ships of the two great fleets sighted each other. The American aircraft carriers USS Enterprise, Yorktown and Hornet faced a much larger Japanese fleet consisting of the carriers Suryu, Akagi, Kaga and Hiryu close to Midway Island. The fate of American aircrew who were shot down during the terrific air battle to destroy these carriers and were captured by the Japanese only came to light after the war when the U.S. Navy obtained a copy of Vice Admiral Chuichi Nogumo's Japanese fleet action report. The fates of three men in particular caused the Americans to launch an investigation into possible war crimes having been committed against prisoners of war. The first story concerns a young American naval aviator who was part of a torpedo bomber attack on the Japanese carrier force on the morning of the 5th of June. The torpedo bomber squadron suffered the heaviest casualties as they launched virtually suicidal attacks on the Japanese carriers through swarms of enemy fighters and clouds of flak. Of 41 Douglas TBD-1 devastators that took off on these missions, 37 were shot down. The story of one squadron's battle showed how savage the fighting became and how the Japanese were ill-disposed to grant downed airmen any quarter. Twelve devastators of U.S. Navy Squadron VT-3 lumbered into the air off the deck of the Yorktown and headed for the last reported position of the enemy's carriers. Led by Lieutenant Commander Lance E. Massey, the last aircraft in the formation was piloted by Ensign Wesley Osmus. Osmus, sitting in front of his radio operator gunner, Benjamin R. Dodson, Jr., was in the most vulnerable position effectively the formation's tail-end Charlie. Osmus had enlisted in the U.S. Naval Reserve in 1940, and this was his first experience of combat. When VT-3 was 14 miles from their target, the squadron was pounced on by defending Japanese Zero fighters. The Zeros came in behind the Devastators, and although the rear gunners did what they could to try to force them off, it was an unequal fight. According to Osmus's Navy Cross citation, quote, Participating in a torpedo plane assault against Japanese naval units, Ensign Osmus, in the face of tremendous anti-aircraft fire and overwhelming fighter opposition, pressed home his attack to a point where it became relatively certain that, in order to accomplish his mission, he would probably sacrifice his life. 
Undeterred by the grave possibilities of such a hazardous offensive, he carried on, with extreme disregard for his own personal safety, until his squadron scored direct hits on two enemy aircraft carriers. Unquote. Shortly after unloading his munitions, Osmus's plane took a burst of zero cannon fire that killed or badly wounded Dodson, and seconds later the plane's fuel tanks exploded. Osmus unclipped his safety harness and bailed out after desperately attempting to get a response from Dodson over the plane's intercom. After jumping clear, Osmus watched the burning devastator as it spiralled away into the Pacific like a huge torch. Osmus floated gently down to the ocean. Once in the water, he quickly divested himself of his chute and inflated his life jacket. He also deployed his emergency life raft and clambered aboard it to await an uncertain rescue. Unfortunately for the young American airman, he was picked up by the Japanese destroyer Arashi, part of Rear Admiral Kimura's Destroyer Division 4, providing an advanced screening force ahead of the main Japanese fleet. Hauled aboard and immediately stripped of his flying equipment, pistol and life jacket, the young American pilot was taken before the skipper for questioning. At this stage of the battle, with the carrier Akagi already ablaze, suspicion was mounting in the Japanese camp as to how many American carriers they were actually facing. Commander Yasumasa Watanabe threatened Osmus with his sword, demanding intelligence on the location, names and numbers of American ships, and promising dire consequences if the pilot refused to talk. Faced with continual slaps and the threat of beheading, Osmus told the Japanese that they were up against the carriers Yorktown, Enterprise and Hornet. This information was immediately sent by Morse Lamp to the carrier Hiryu. Osmus, perhaps believing that his cooperation under extreme duress had probably bought him his life, did not realize that as far as Watanabe was concerned, the terrified young man was now surplus to requirements. And even though he should have been taken prisoner and treated decently, Watanabe later ordered his execution. Chief Warrant Officer Sato was instructed to carry out this order, and gathering some of his men, they dragged the confused and frightened American towards the destroyer's stern, one of them ominously carrying a fire axe. Roughly ordered to face astern, a Japanese sailor swung the axe at Osmus's neck, but failed to decapitate him with the blow. The axe cut knocked Osmus partly over the ship's rail, but although in agony he managed to catch hold of the chain railing and clung on desperately, swinging about above the churning propellers as the Arashi made way. The axe-wielding Japanese struck Osmus again with the blade, and dead or critically injured, the American pilot fell into the destroyer's wake and disappeared. This war crime remained unpunished, and not a single member of the crew of the Arashi was ever brought before a military court for the murder of Ensign Osmus. Most of the Japanese involved in the atrocity perished later in the war, and so building a case was impossible. Osmus, however, was honoured by his country. On the 4th of November 1943, the destroyer escort USS Osmus was launched in Bay City, Michigan, and the ensign was posthumously awarded the Navy Cross, Purple Heart, and the American Defence Medal for his courage in pressing home his aerial assault on the Japanese carriers. Flying off the USS Enterprise, Lieutenant Commander C. Wade McCluskey led 30 Douglas SBD-3 Dauntless dive bombers on a mission that would ultimately lead to the destruction of the Japanese aircraft carriers Akagi and Kaga. The air over the two carriers, which was soon an inferno following McCluskey's successful strike, was thick with American and Japanese planes. Dauntless dive bombers were milling around over the target, many of the pilots' rookies who were looking to more experienced aviators to lead them back to the Enterprise. Japanese Zero fighters attempted to wreak their revenge for the American success. One of the experienced American pilots was Lieutenant Charles Ware, and he managed to gather together five other aircraft into an ad hoc group, ordering them to close up and descend to sea level for the return flight to the Enterprise. 
Zero fighters trailed them away from the burning carriers, making strafing attacks from behind, and Wade ordered the gunners in his formation to concentrate the fire of their twin 30 caliber machine guns on each Zero as it made its attack pass. This tactic prevented the Japanese from causing serious damage to the aircraft, with the exception of the Dauntless flown by ensign Frank W. O'Flaherty. Japanese bullets damaged O'Flaherty's fuel tanks, and as all the American aircraft were already short of fuel after a long mission against the carriers, the situation became critical for the young pilot. Ware's formation managed to extricate itself from the Japanese defensive screen and headed off northeast, where they hoped to find the Enterprise. Unfortunately, the American aircraft was spotted by a formation of Aichi Val dive bombers from the carrier Hiryu, escorted by six Zeros. The Japanese fighters immediately broke away from the dive bombers and pounced on Ware and his comrades, thinking they were easy pickings. Ware ordered his men into the same formation they had used to beat off the earlier Japanese attacks above the carriers. But just before the Japanese fighters were upon them, Ensign O'Flaherty radioed Ware that he was out of fuel and was going to ditch in the ocean. There was nothing anyone could do except watch as O'Flaherty took the Dauntless down to wave top level and gently belly flopped his aircraft into the sea. O'Flaherty and his gunner, Bruno Jado, were observed clambering out of the cockpit before the plane sank beneath them and they took to their tiny inflatable rubber life raft. O'Flaherty and Jado listened as the sounds of battle and aircraft engines retreated into the distance until they were alone on the expanse of ocean. Rescue when it came was to prove their demise. The Japanese destroyer Makigumo hove to, and the two airmen were hauled aboard to a hostile reception. By now, both sides knew that the Japanese were reeling from a crushing defeat, and the sailors were in an ugly mood. Stripped of their equipment, the two Americans were interrogated savagely by vengeful Japanese. Both men were subsequently murdered as an act of revenge for the American victory on the orders of the captain of the Makigumo. Undoubtedly, O'Flaherty especially would have been in the possession of some minor tactical information that was probably either beaten or threatened out of him before the Japanese decided to dispose of their prisoners. O'Flaherty and Jado were both bound with stout ropes to which weighted fuel cans were tied. Not even having the decency to grant their opponents a quick death by shooting them, the Japanese captain ordered the Americans so tied to be dumped overboard by the crew. Amid shouts for mercy and pleading for their lives, O'Flaherty and Jado were thrown from the destroyer's stern and immediately disappeared beneath the waves to suffer a horrible death by drowning. Lieutenant Ware and the remaining aircraft of his formation managed to defend themselves against the Zero attacks, with two of the enemy fighters limping off towards the Hiryu, and the other four unable to catch up with the Vowel dive bombers that they were supposed to escort. When the Vowels launched their attack on the USS Yorktown, all except one would fall victim to American anti-aircraft fire or fighters. Ware and the others were lost, for they did not know the exact location of the Enterprise, and their fuel situation was becoming more precarious by the minute. Ensign McCarthy radioed Ware that he was going on alone, on a different course, to try to find the American fleet, and Ware wished him good luck. The other rookie pilots decided to stay close to Ware, which proved to be a tragic mistake. The four dauntless dive bombers ran out of fuel somewhere out in the empty Pacific, and they all undoubtedly ended up ditching in the sea and their crews taking to life rafts. None of the eight men was ever heard from again, dying lonely deaths far out at sea. Ensign McCarthy was the only one who would make it, and only just as it turned out. Critically low on fuel, McCarthy picked up the homing beacon signal of the USS Yorktown, which brought him to the edge of the American fleet. Out of fuel, he crash-landed his plane in the sea, and he and his gunner were rescued by the destroyer USS Heyman. The murderers of O'Flaherty and Jado were never brought to trial, as the destroyer Makigumo struck a mine during operations off Guadalcanal in 1943 and was lost. 
Perhaps other American pilots and aircrew were also picked up by Japanese destroyers screening the combined fleet during the midway battle. But if they were, none lived to tell the tale. The summary and unnecessarily cruel executions of Osmus, O'Flaherty and Jado demonstrated the dishonourable attitude of the Imperial Japanese Navy towards its opponents in war, and stood in stark contrast to the treatment of Japanese aircrew who became prisoners of the United States, who afforded them prisoner of war status. The full impotent rage and vindictive revenge of Japanese officers who keenly felt their nation's defeat at sea was channelled into the decisions to kill the airmen, perhaps to assuage their own sense of shame in losing the battle upon which Japan had pinned so many of her hopes. You have been listening to Midway Pilots, Prisoners of the Japanese, written and narrated by Dr. Mark Felton. For a wide variety of military history videos, please visit my other YouTube channel, Mark Felton Productions. You can also help to support both of my channels at PayPal and Patreon. Details in the description box below.